Section three of How to Sing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ruth Golding. How to Sing by Lily Lehman. Translated by Richard Aldrich. Section three of The Breath and Whirling Currents. Singing Forward. Very few singers know that in order to use the breath to the fullest advantage, it must also remain very long diffused back in the mouth. A mistaken idea of singing forward tempts most to expel it with the diaphragm and thus waste it, one of the most common errors. The diaphragm, to the contrary, must be relaxed after every attack. That is, it must be made pliable which act results in the flexibility of all muscular tension of the vocal organs. These, as soon as they are well placed, in good relation one to the other, and tensed, will be put in an elastic condition through the gentle relaxation of the diaphragm after the attack has commanded entire energetic concentration. Naturally, neither the form nor the cooperating muscular tension should be altered by it. These should only be made elastic and mobile for further demands to be put upon them. In this way the breath can be regulated and be made use of sparingly. The column of breath coming in an uninterrupted stream from the larynx must, as soon as it flows into the form prepared for it according to the required tone by the tongue and palate, fill this form soaring through all its corners with its vibrations. It makes whirling currents, which circulate in the elastic form surrounding it, and it must remain there till the tone is high enough, strong enough, and sustained enough to satisfy the judgment of the singer as well as the ear of the listener. Should there be lacking the least element of pitch, strength, or duration, the tone is imperfect and does not meet the requirement. Learning and teaching to hear is the first task of both pupil and teacher. One is impossible without the other. It is the most difficult as well as the most grateful task, and it is the only way to reach perfection. Even if the pupil unconsciously should produce a flawless tone, it is the teacher's duty to acquaint him clearly with the causes of it. It is not enough to sing well. One must also know how one does it. The teacher must tell the pupil constantly, making him describe clearly his sensations in singing, and understand fully the physiological factors that cooperate to produce them. The sensations in singing must coincide with mine as here described, if they are to be considered as correct. For mine are based logically on physiological causes, and correspond precisely with the operation of these causes. Moreover, all my pupils tell me, often to be sure not till many months have passed, how exact my explanations are how accurately, on the strength of them, they have learned to feel the physiological processes. They have learned, slowly to be sure, to become conscious of their errors and false impressions, for it is very difficult to ascertain such mistakes and false adjustments of the organs. False sensations in singing and disregarded or false ideas of physiological processes cannot immediately be stamped out. A long time is needed for the mind to be able to form a clear image of those processes, and not till then can knowledge and improvement be expected. The teacher must repeatedly explain the physiological processes. The pupil repeatedly disclose every confusion and uncertainty he feels, until the perfect consciousness of his sensations in singing is irrevocably impressed upon his memory that is, has become a habit. Among a hundred singers, hardly one can be found whose single tones meet every requirement, and among a thousand listeners, even among teachers and among artists, hardly one hears it. 
I admit that such perfect tones sometimes, generally quite unconsciously, are heard from young singers, and especially from beginners, and never fail to make an impression. The teacher hears that they are good, so does the public. Only a very few know why, even among singers, because only a very few know the laws governing perfect tone production. Their talent, their ear, perchance, tell them the truth, but the causes they neither know nor look for. On such unconscious singing, directors, managers, and even conductors build mistakenly their greatest hopes. No one hears what is lacking, or what will soon be lacking, and all are surprised when experienced singers protest against it. They become enthusiastic, properly, over beautiful voices, but pursue quite the wrong path in training them for greater tasks. As soon as such persons are obtained, they are immediately bundled into all roles. They have hardly time to learn one role by heart, to say nothing of comprehending it and working it up artistically. The stars must shine immediately. But with what resources? With the fresh voice alone? Who is there to teach them to use their resources on the stage? Who to husband them for the future? The manager? The director? Not at all. When the day comes that they can no longer perform what not they themselves, but the directors expected of them, they are put to one side. And if they do not possess great energy and strength, often entirely succumb. They could not meet the demands made upon them, because they did not know how to use their resources. I shall be told that tones well sung, even unconsciously, are enough. But that is not true. The least unfavourable circumstance, overexertion, indisposition, an unaccustomed situation, anything can blow out the unconscious one's light, or at least make it flicker badly. Of any self-help, when there is ignorance of all the fundamentals, there can be no question. Any help is grasped at. Then appears the so-called but false individuality, under whose mask so much that is bad presents itself to art and before the public. This is not remarkable, in view of the complexity of the phenomena of song. Few teachers concern themselves with the fundamental studies. They often do not sing at all themselves, or they sing quite wrongly, and consequently can neither describe the vocal sensations nor test them in others. Theory alone is of no value whatever. With old singers the case is often quite the contrary, so both seize whatever help they can lay hold of. End of section 3